Good morning, Matriculants. Last time we read about first Julia and then Chester who were adopted by Arthur and Ginny Arlington. Today we're going to continue with this story. Sit back, relax, enjoy the reading. Time passed and Chester and Julia were growing up. One day during the summer holidays, the Arlingtons were preparing for a trip to the seaside. It was a hot July day and there was a sense of expectancy in the air. Chester sat on the kitchen step leading to the back garden and watched Arthur loading a film into his camera. Behind them, in the kitchen, Jenny and Julia were covering the picnic basket with a bright red tablecloth. Dad, who's my real mother? Chester asked all of a sudden. Arthur stopped what he was doing for a second and then proceeded very deliberately to wind the film forward, squinting through the lens as he did so. Chester felt his heart beating very fast. He didn't know what had prompted the question and was afraid of the answer. Arthur stood up and moved towards his wife like a much older person. When he reached Ginny, he stopped and turned to face his son. Why are you asking? he said softly. I just want to know who my parents are, said Chester. At school they say I can't be your child because I'm black. Julia suddenly covered her ears and burst into tears. Jenny held her, murmuring comfortingly, and Chester felt guilty again. It's okay, Julia, he said. You're white, like them. You're their child. But I'm different. Arthur's voice was gentle but firm when he told everyone to sit down. Including you, Chester. Let's all sit down round the table and talk about this. We were going to tell you soon, but since you've brought it up, we might as well do it now. Julia, sitting next to Ginny, sniffed quietly. She was wearing the white dress with red flowers that reminded Chester of poppies on Remembrance Day. She was as pretty as a little girl in a picture book, but now she sat with her eyes lowered staring at the plastic check tablecloth. Ginny looked more serious than Chester had ever seen her, and he was frightened of what he had unleashed. He looked from one to the other. He fidgeted nervously, licking his lips. We both love you very much, Arthur Arlington began, covering Ginny's right hand, which was lying on the table. Her left hand was holding one of Julia's, so the three of them were joined together. Arthur was not given to much affectionate demonstration, so his caressing of Jenny's hand emphasised the gravity of whatever he was about to say. Some children are born to parents who don't want them, he began. Or, Jenny quickly interrupted, some parents want their children but can't afford to keep them. Why can't they keep them? Chester asked, forgetting he had meant to be quiet and listen. The Reverend Arlington decided to press on with his speech. He had already prepared himself to tell the, ch the children that they were not their real parents. He wanted to say that, though they were adopted, they were loved and had been chosen by them. However, he knew the last part was not completely true. He and Jenny had not chosen these children. They had been brought. It made no difference, of course, but he was accustomed to sticking to the facts. He called it telling the truth. He knew too that behind Ginny's calm exterior, she still harboured a fear that one day a woman would materialise and ask for a child back. And how could he tell a sensitive ten-year-old like Julia that she was found left in a Tesco bag at a telephone booth on a freezing day when she was only a few hours old? He dreaded the effect it might have on her. This had haunted him ever since he and Jenny had decided they must tell the children the truth. As for Chester, Arthur knew his outward toughness was self-protective. He knew that Chester needed careful handling and he and Jenny had tried their best to provide it. He decided to get it out quickly, however brutal it sounded. Julia, we don't actually know who your parents are. Not for want of trying, believe me. Your mother left you on a, in a phone booth inside a Tesco shopping bag. You were only a few hours old and a boy called Julian found you on his paper round 
and brought you here. We fostered you and applied for adoption. The authorities put us through hell before they eventually capitulated and allowed us to be your parents. The battle was worth it and we are very proud. Chester, your mother read about Julia in the papers and when she was looking for a good home for you, she wrote asking us to have you. She felt she couldn't look after you herself because she was expecting twins and the baby's father didn't want another child on his hands. She knew we were Christians and hoped you would get the love you needed from us. She was Nigerian. We tried to trace her, but she had disappeared. The most important thing is that to us, you're our children and we love you both very much. Now it was Chester's turn to stare at the tablecloth. Jenny and Arthur waited anxiously, but Chester was lost for words. He sat quite still digesting what he had just heard. He had been frightened of being told he was adopted. Now that he had heard it, he did not quite know what to do. Julia got up slowly, walked to the kitchen window and looked outside. Can we go to the beach now? She asked in a perfectly normal voice. In relief, the other three stood up and bustled round the kitchen. The truth was out and only time would tell what difference it would make. That evening, as the children were going to bed, Jenny opened her arms wide to both of them. Julia walked into her embrace, but Chester hung back. Jenny spoke over Julia's head. Sometimes we just have to accept what we can't change. I had to accept that I couldn't have babies of my own. Then I got you, and you've made me happier than anything. I always thought God had performed a miracle bringing you here. Chester, seeing a tear slide down her cheek, relented and moved into her arms as well. He felt Arthur join them, and they all held onto each other in silence for a minute. Arthur realized he was praying with gratitude. Sometime after the revelation about his mother, Chester started to have a recurring dream. Though it usually came at night, it sometimes came during the day as well, and nothing he could do would dispel it. It came to him in fragments at first, but after a while, it acquired concrete images and a definite theme. It opened in surroundings he took to be an African village. There were several small round thatched huts arranged around a much bigger one. The grounds of the compound were swept every morning by handsome young men with armlets around their strong upper arms. Encircling their waists were skirts, the likes of which Chester had never seen before. They were full, and on closer inspection he saw that they were made of light pleated material of many bright colours. These young men swept the compound in long, clean strokes, like people paddling canoes. There were also women, some carrying pots of food or water pitchers on their heads. People came and went in the compound, including many children whose happy noise filled the air. Chester noticed, however, that they were all girl children. That part of the dream haunted him. Why should there be a compound full of girls and women in strange yet beautiful clothes going about ordinary daily routines? He could tell that this was not an ordinary place. It was more like a city in microcosm. There were gate men who collected all manner of foodstuffs from people on their way to the innermost part of the enclosure. Everybody coming from the farms outside had to give them something. They would lay down the offering, make a low bow, straighten themselves and disappear in different directions. Chester started identifying this compound as his very own. He didn't doubt its existence but felt sure it was somewhere waiting for him to come and claim it. He did not, however, trust himself to tell anyone about it. Sometimes, during quiet afternoons, when he unguardedly drifted into his city, a smile would appear on his face, like the smile of an old person remembering childhood. His family would stare at Chester with their brows arched, wondering the reason for this dreamy amiability. They never got an answer. Some days, 
He toyed with the idea of telling Julia and asking her if she would like to come with him when the time came for him to claim his city. Waking up, he dispelled the idea. Ever since the day their father confirmed that they were adopted, Julia had become more introverted. She had developed a trick of staring into empty space as if looking for something. And then she would come to herself, gradually focusing on the floor as she lowered her eyes. It was impossible to guess her thoughts. Her eyes were like a pair of windows, which, once closed and fastened, allowed no one to peep into the room of her mind. When, moments later, she raised her eyes, her blank, innocent stare would make the onlooker turn away in guilty confusion, as if caught spying. Jenny found such times perplexing. It would sound stupid to ask another person why they were avoiding looking at people, staring at nothing or at the floor instead, even though the person happened to be her daughter, Julia. Nonetheless, her anxiety began to grow and she lost some of her characteristic calm serenity. Arthur, sitting at the end of the kitchen table and forever making notes for his sermons, missed very little of the goings-on. He showed his concern by being gentler than usual with his wife and daughter. As a result, it came as a surprise that he should lose his temper on one particular occasion. This particular day, the family was having breakfast at the kitchen table, with Jenny trying too hard to make conversation. Chester was lost in his dream city, and Julia was gazing at the floor. Arthur, as usual, was scribbling notes as he ate breakfast. That weatherman is no prophet, is he? He always gets it wrong. It looks like rain again today. How was your egg, dear? She suddenly addressed Arthur. Fine, thank you, dear. I'm trying to put down a few points for my prayers at the Mother's Union this afternoon. Without raising his eyes, Arthur continued to scribble as if his life depended on it. Instinctively, Julia lifted her gaze from the floor and caught Chester's eye. They both smiled knowingly. Arthur, do you know that Mrs. Merton's cousin living in New Zealand died? I mean to tell you. You did. You told me yesterday and the day before. Arthur said roughly, pushing his chair back noisily and standing up. Oh, did I? Jenny said innocently. In the loud silence that followed, Julia lifted her hand and knocked her over a teacup. It fell and smashed on the tiled floor, tea spreading around her feet. Julia opened her eyes wide, dramatizing her innocent blue stare, which made Chester burst into laughter. It was a spontaneous reaction, but he noticed too late that he was the only one who found it funny. Arthur faced Chester squarely, his face red with rage. He could hardly contain the storm raging inside him. In an effort to control himself, he gripped the edge of the kitchen table and his knuckles showed white. Straightening up, he asked slowly and deliberately, And what is so amusing about all this, Chester? Nothing, Dad, I just laughed. At what? You just laughed at nothing. People don't just laugh at nothing. Julia looked troubled as if she had broken the most expensive plate in the house. It's only a cup, she cried, scrabbling under the table for the pieces. She accidentally brushed Chester's leg, so that he jumped and pushed his chair away from the table. She at least is sorry, Arthur said, pointing a shaking finger at Julia. Chester hung his head. I'm sorry, I only laughed. He didn't mean to, endorsed Julia. Knowing full well, the part she played in the confusion, and that Chester would not tell on her. It's not of the end of the world after all. Stop it! Stop it, all of you! Jenny intervened, shaking her head vigorously. Her voice was trembling, near tears. Chester made a dive for his school bag. Oh, no, you don't. You can clear the table and wash the breakfast things, ordered Arthur. But why, Dad? I only laughed, and I'll be late for school. Chester protested. Then you'll tell your teacher that you were late because you were being punished. Chester put his school bag down and grudgingly did as he was told. When he had finished, he slung his knapsack on his back 
pushed his resentment to the back of his mind and ran out of the house. He caught up with Julia and some of her friends, walking to school. See what you got me into, he said to Julia. Get lost, Chester. Pamela, Julia's best friend, responded belligerently. We don't talk to boys. Now it was Julia's turn to laugh. Chester shrugged and shot past them on his way to the gym. What was all that about? Pamela asked Julia. Julia in turn shrugged her shoulders. She put a finger over her lips and said in a stage whisper, Family secrets. Do you know, you and Chester are starting to be as weird as your mother. Julia fell silent and Pamela knew she had gone too far. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, she said. Julia shrugged again and the two girls followed their frosty breath into the classroom. Once Jenny and Arthur had acknowledged that he was adopted, Chester knew that he would have to leave home some day. Not that this was a unique step, because he had seen young people in his father's parish leave to work in the city. Some of them even travelled abroad. Sometimes they came back to St. Simon to show off their new elevated positions and to see their families. Chester told himself that he would like to be like that one day. But he had a strong sense of something he had to do first. He needed to find out where exactly the city of his dreams was located. Though it felt real to him, he could discuss it with nobody and he was haunted by it. Though his parents never made him feel his being adopted was an act of charity, yet he knew he had to be good. Not only was he a vicar's son, but he was the only black boy in the community. Nothing was ever said, but he was made aware of his difference by subtle gestures which made him feel that much was expected of him. He had to try that much harder to be accepted, to show what he was worth, and at times he was so overwhelmed by this that he would escape into his city and stay there for hours on end. If the reverend noticed anything strange in any members of his family, he didn't show it. He allowed things to take them course but noticed more than he appeared to. Near Christmas, he was working as usual on a sermon while Jenny was making another robe for another nativity play. She called Chester to come and try it on, but received no reply. When she called again, Chester ran down the stairs, banged the front door and ran all the way to the miller's house. I don't think he's keen on that part again this year, Arthur suggested tactfully. Jenny looked despondent. Why ever not? He's always done it. Lots of children want to be the first king. Yes, dear, but things change. He's getting older, persisted Arthur. But I was up all night making this a really good costume. She held it up for Julia and Arthur to admire. That's right. Maybe he doesn't want the part any longer. It's boring having to play the best part all the time, Julia chimed in. It's only three days before the play. He has to do the part this year at least. I know Chester likes to act. Arthur shrugged and said, Good luck, but giving him an unrealistic dream is not helping him, Jenny. Jenny looked so wounded that Julia jumped in. Mum, it's getting late. Let's go and get him. Julia and Jenny went out into the night and knocked at the miller's door. Mrs. Miller appeared on a wave of noise and heat from the front room. It was like opening an oven. Oh, Jenny, you must be looking for Chester. He's a bit upset. He says he no longer wants to be a king in the play. He wants to be an ordinary shepherd. Before she could continue, Julia called over her shoulder to Chester. It's late, Chester, let's go. Chester came downstairs, followed by Ray and his brothers and sisters. He spoke with determination. Mother, I don't want to be a king any longer. The others call me king of the devils. Oh, never, cried Mrs. Miller, turning to Ginny. Children can be so cruel. Not to his face, though, Julia explained. No, but I told him, Ray said. Ginny was beginning to look as if it was all too much for her.
she had never encountered a problem of this kind before and was at a loss unkindness and negative criticism were not part of her personality so it was julia who took control thanks a lot mrs miller we'd better go home now come on chester the three of them walked home in silence it was accepted that chester would not be king and when another boy was chosen to be the leader of the three wise men that year jenny said nothing but at the performance she could not conceal her unhappiness she clapped half-heartedly, wilting like a dying rose petal. Chester was given a job backstage and was happy with his invisibility, even while he felt guilty that again he had ruined another's pleasure. But he was beginning to learn an important lesson, that he didn't have to allow other people to tell him what to do. To make it up to Ginny, he not only made her an elaborate Christmas card, he decided to buy her a present as well. He chose a diary with a pretty cover of roses and violets for his mother to record her appointments. To keep it a surprise, instead of putting it under the Christmas tree, he tiptoed up behind her when she was completely engrossed in the kitchen early on Christmas morning and gave it to her. Very quickly, to be sure he had her alone, he said, I'm sorry about the play, Mum. I just didn't want to be a king anymore. Ginny, delighted with the present, hugged him. It's all right, Chester. I just didn't realise you felt so strongly. Let's forget about it and have a happy Christmas. What a beautiful diary. Those are my favourite flowers. She kissed him and Chester glowed. He had done the right thing for once. In Chester's mind, this incident ended his childhood years. He was still the vicar's son, but he had gained a little independence. Most importantly, he had done it without too great cost to his mother. He hated to hurt her. As for his father, he couldn't be hurt. He was the rock of Gibraltar. Right, matriculants, at last, that is the end of this very long short story, The New Tribe. So when we meet up again, I am going to do the discussion. We're going to have a look at figures of speech, difficult words, characterization and the likes. Please have a great day. Stay safe. Bye, everyone.